Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. And I'm Matt Miller. We have so much going on in markets this week. You've got the Treasury refunding, mm -hmm. you've got the Fed, and then the BOJ is going to... That's tonight. And then on Friday, uh -huh. we have the jobs report. Yeah, so a lot. Amazing. A lot. Let's get to the biggest stories in the more than $10 trillion global ETF industry with the Fed expected to hold rates steady for a second meeting. Let's look at Treasury ETFs ahead of the decision and the big refunding announcement as well. Plus, Canada, Canadian flow trends, they're reflecting an uncertain market, but the growth in the country's ETFs remains strong, Matt. As Halloween creeps closer, we're going to look at one of the scariest funds on the market. But Matt, before we get there, unfortunately, Eric Balchun is on vacation today, so I'm going to do my best when we take a look at the flows right now. Let's look at where money was headed over the past week or so. As you can see, both ends of the yield curve getting a little bit of love here. BIL up at the top taking in $1.8 billion. That is the shortest term Treasury bills. TLT, of course, 20 years plus on the Treasury curve, also taking in $1.6 billion. So again, both ends there. And you also had tech taking in cash as well. Triple Q taking in $1.4 billion, even though tech earnings last week were a little bit of a bummer, bummer still, people trying to catch that knife. Let's look at where money was flowing out of. Also an interesting story, up at the top you have S. QQQ, that is an ultra short tech bet against tech. Hard to keep the ticker straight. Losing about a billion dollars. So again, a lot of conviction going into long tech here. XLF, of course, that is your financials ETF, losing about 800 million. And CWB, don't see that too often. It's convertibles, losing about $600 million. But as we mentioned, we have a little bit of a focus on Canada this week. And we know that it's been a zero sum game when it comes to mutual funds and ETFs in the US market. But as you can see in Canada, it's been really even for the last decade or so, both structures taking in money. But now it's starting to reflect what we're seeing in the U.S. as well. You have those white bars that, of course, is mutual funds losing money, while those yellow bars, ETFs, starting to take in money at their expense. So it took a while, Matt, but in Canada as well, mutual funds losing at the expense of ETFs. Yeah, it looks like uh, we could see a winner or a loser there. They also have their HISAs uh, in Canada a number of other things that are a little bit different than we do uh, here in the U.S. Uh, here to help us ex uh, understand, here to explain to us is Valerie Grimba. She's director of global ETF sales and strategy at RBC Capital Markets. I think you're the first person to tell me what a HISA was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good. When you came on this this show, that's a, what, a high yield savings account, essentially. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. Like high interest. So I, instead of the Y, maybe you use I get a high interest savings account. Yeah. So in terms of ETFs versus mutual funds, I mean, yes. do do you see the same way that we see here, a huge drawdown in mutual funds and conversions into ETFs? Yep, absolutely. And I think the HISA product is a brilliant example of that. So all of a sudden, cash is, is an investable asset class, and it hasn't been for decades. And you're seeing it kind of across the investor spectrum. Everyone from DIY investors to advisors to institutions are looking at their cash allocation and choosing an ETF wrapper to kind of put their cash to work uh, within an ETF. And so this, this category has seen monster flows this year, 10 billion across about 12 or 15 funds. So just really concentrated and just showing you that the ETF is kind of maybe a preferred vehicle for cash exposure right now. And what about conversions? Do you see a lot of conversions this year? Because we saw a ton last year and mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like we had the same impetus. Yeah, in Canada, conversion is not the same. We don't have the same restrictions, but we definitely see uh, more ETF series of a mutual fund. So ETF providers are becoming more wrapper agnostic and sorry I should say asset managers rather and so they just want to say we want to be able to offer our top-notch products in kind of whatever vehicle an investor chooses and so we're seeing more and more kind of proliferation and growth into the ETF space. So a similar story between the US and Canada there another similar story is what we're seeing with covered call ETFs, basically these derivatives-based funds. They've obviously exploded in the U.S. this year, both in terms of assets and launches. Seems like you're seeing a similar sort of trend come about in Canada. And the question that I've been asking all year is, what's the limit here? When are we going to see uh, peak derivatives ETFs? It's a great question, and it's definitely been an explosion in Canada as well. I think we started the year with about 60 funds, which is already over-indexed to the size of the Canadian market, and especially 
especially relative to the U.S. market as well. Canadians do love yield, so it's not surprising. But the category has almost doubled mm -hmm. in the in the ten months so far in 2023. Now over a hundred products. So everyone's trying to get a slice of the pie. But it's not surprising because they have been real cash cows for ETF providers. They account for about a third of all Canadian equity inflows this year. Mm. So there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of money flowing into the space. And so we'll kind of see. And also the market setup has been favorable for these types of funds. They have kind of outperformed over the last six months with sideways to downwards markets. But you know, investors kind of need to know what they're buying because you know, if markets change, if a bull run happens, then it's a different scenario and they just need to understand the limitations of these funds. So maybe a market turn will sort of take the steam out of that trade. But an existential question I have about these, you mentioned they're about a third of Canadian inflows. Uh, I would imagine it's something similar in the U.S., but these count as actively managed products, even though it's not necessarily stock picking. And when you think about that in the context of the big flows that we've seen into active products these years, this year, it just feels like a little bit of a footnote that it's not exactly what you may think. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a great way for active management to kind of show off and to, to flex because you've got someone out there that's kind of looking through these option strategies and you've got a professional that's um, kind of going in and out of the market and taking advantage of when they want to sell vol. And it's hard for a DIY investor to do that or an advisor to do that. So it kind of gives this institutional look through for them. Um, and then, it, you know, I think it just, again, gives asset managers a chance to kind of show off what kind of extra value they can bring to the table. We're all waiting for a spot Bitcoin ETF approval here in the U.S. from the SEC. And it feels like um, Canadian, you already have the product. Obviously, you beat us to it. Um, <laughs> but they're getting hyped up as well by pouring inflows into the Bitcoin ETFs that you have. Yes, it's, it's just changed in the last week. I think we're about six months out since the BlackRock filing that kind of shook the world came out. And it was, it was relatively quiet in the Canadian, Canadian space through 2023. No real inflows or outflows to speak of. Uh, but in the last week, we've saw volumes kind of skyrocket in the kind of largest spot Bitcoin ETF we have and inflows to follow. So about 200 million into a handful of products is significant and uh, kind of suggests you know, kind of increasing widespread interest coming back into the, the space. You have beat us to uh, legal weed um, <laughs> investment products as well. Yes. And, but it, it hasn't gone that, that well, right? In fact, we had the CEO of Tilray on recently and it yeah. seemed like he only wanted to talk about craft beers. Yeah. <laughs> which is like, I guess that's a pivot, right? Spiritually similar, but. <laughs> I, ha, have they all made that kind of pivot? How's that industry? Yeah, again, like cannabis is just, it's, it's so volatile. It's like one of those ones that pops up if we're looking at top performers of the year of the quarter and then all of a sudden you'll see this raft of cannabis but ETFs why? at the Only top. because of legislation expectations, Pretty right? Because the, the, the revenue stream isn't volatile. It just grows and grows and grows and grows. Yes, it's kind of been, I think, a long line of like GDP growth in Canada since they've legalized it about five or six years ago. And it really is just waiting with bated breath for safe banking rules. Um, so I think it'll just remain volatile until then. And just quickly, when it comes to those sorts of episodes where suddenly there's a big pop because of legislation expectations, maybe you see a wave of filings to follow that. Do people actually put money into these funds? Do people actually put real meaningful assets into these funds during the, those experiences? I mean, it depends. Uh, so I would say like Bitcoin has definitely been asset allocation. It has been kind of buy and hold investment. We see that through the flows. They were sticky through 2022 when you have this crypto winter, when we had the FTX collapse. But cannabis probably is more of a trading vehicle. Mm -hmm. I don't think you get the same buy and hold audience. It's more, I hear something and I want to get access to exposure and I can do that to the basket of the sector through an ETF and that's kind of the easiest way to play that. Not a lot of conviction. No. Which is good. We don't want a lot of conviction. No. Right? I mean, that's what, it's more fun. That's what makes a market. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Valerie, great having you on the program. Thanks very much for joining us. Valerie Grimbo there of RBC. Coming up, we're going to drill down into treasuries with Alex Morris, CIO at FM Investments. Next, uh, probably one of the hottest assets that we're going to be talking about all week long. Certainly has been for the past weeks. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Matt Miller alongside Katie Greifeld. And it's time for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. And today in the hot seat, we have T-Bill. And I am so excited to talk about this product. As the name implies, it only invests in T-Bills, three-month Treasury bills to be exact. This ETF was only launched last August, which we're going to get to, and it charges about 15 basis points. Let's quickly look at the holdings. Uh, just so you know, I'm not lying. This is only T-Bills. About 99.5% of the portfolio is in Treasury bills, as you can see, the remaining in spots. So reliable, not surprising. Let's talk about the asset growth because it has been fantastic to watch. I love this chart because it's basically like an airplane taking off. You can see it really uh, hit the acceleration in March or so of this year. And now it's sitting at two and a half billion dollars in assets under management. Again, just to say this again, it only launched in August of 2022. So that kind of growth, it's hard to come by. But you think about the environment we're in, Matt, right now and how high yields are at the front end of the curve. This was a pretty well-timed launch, I would say. Absolutely. Plus, um, it gave rise to the phrase T-bill and chill, <laughs> which is like what all the kids are saying. Katie, thanks very much. Joining us to talk about this ETF is Alex Morris, CIO of FM Investments. Alex, thanks very much for coming uh, back to Bloomberg to talk to us. So, I mean, it seems like uh, everyone is T-bill and chilling right now. We hope um, so. <laughs> and it doesn't look like there's going to be any turn of events in terms of um, the yield, right? So you're not going to lose a lot of money at the front end of the curve. Well, that's a thought. And if we look at the restructuring coming, although the, the Treasury is going to move about 5% towards the long end of the curve, there's still going to be a lot of interest in the short end. I mean, when are we going to find that out, by the way? We've been talking about this. So today yeah. at 3, um, they're going to announce how much money they need. And then Wednesday morning at 830. Wednesday morning, they tell us where they're going to go. Yeah. And obviously, the auctions will determine how effective they can be at that. I mean, that's their intent. But putting out a lot of money, the long end of the curve is going to be hard. They're going to have to offer materially higher rates to attract demand. I mean, we've seen rates sell off. Although there seems to be a natural floor or ceiling, as it were, at about 5 percent where the buyers flood back in. But long term, the Treasury has got to balance the books. And a lot of it's been short term because they're uncertain of what Congress is going to do, right? They have to be more flexible if they don't know if they can hit the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. If you start pushing things out 10, 20, 30 years, you take away your optionality. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And you combine that with fears about Japanese buyers, which Matt and I were also talking about uh, in the commercial break. There are Japanese buyers? They are. They're not in the Treasury market right now, yeah. theoretically. Yeah. But let's talk about your product lineup, because T-Bill obviously has been a smash success. But you write in your notes, if you like T-Bill, you'll also like X-Bill and O-Bill. I hope that's O-Bill or That is O-Bill. OK, O-Bill and U-10 for duration. But even still, then you look at the lineup, it's really seen much of the concentration just in T-bill. What does that say to you about risk appetite right now? Certainly that there's less risk than perhaps there was two years ago, but also folks like yield. I mean, T-bill was the first to really hit 5%. We should tell our viewers what X-bill and O-bill are. So, right? so T-bill, X-bill, and O-bill are the short end of the curve. So one buys the on-the-run 90-day, which is T-bill. X-bill is the on-the-run six-month, and O-bill is the on-the-run one year. And these, when we show the yield curve, these are those points on the yield curve. Mm -hmm. And by investing in just those securities, you stay super liquid which everyone thinks treasury market is really liquid. And so you start looking at the screens and realize if you go a couple of generations off on the run, liquidity tends to dry up. And in this market, when you're trying to buy yield and take risk off the table, you don't want to add pricing risk back into your equation. So folks have really reacted to that. x bills yielding a little more than T-bill right now. So for going from three to six months, you pick up extra few basis points, which is material in that end of the curve. Mm. But I think the interest has been purely yield. Folks like yield. They like having low risk. They like being liquid where they can move in and out. And now increasingly we see folks buying more into duration. So we see the middle of the curve start to pick up some assets. And the great news there is if you're a little early on that trade, it's actually a good time to get in. Like you're not penalized for coming in a few months early there. Well, let's talk about that because you and I have had conversations about the risk reward at the long end of the curve right now. And a lot of people are scared of stepping in, catching the knife, so to speak. But as you lay out, I mean, if you go in right now, you stand to profit a lot more from a rally than you do if you, you see yields go the other way and you actually lose a little bit. Right. There's some really interesting asymmetries around 5, 7, and 10, really juicy around 7 and 10, where even if rates move a little bit against you, your downside is just so minimal compared to the upside in that market. And again, you're still holding a treasury. So there's no repayment risk. There's no credit risk. But you now get some really nice total return. 
And that wasn't true a year ago when rates were still on the ascendancy. But now that the Fed's made pretty clear, rates are probably not going to go much higher. That trade has really started to work for you. How much of a difference does Wednesday morning make? I mean, if you're going to invest, would you say, I'll wait until Wednesday <laughs> noon to do it? Yeah, I don't think it makes that big of a difference just because the market is so big. And if you're doing this for more than a few weeks of investment, you're not going to miss that much. So maybe you'll miss that, that best trade of your life by a few you know, basis points. But I don't know that I would put that much worry on that because anything that happens on Wednesday is going to take months and quarters to really play out. I want to talk about a little bit more about the asymmetry at the long end of the curve and the risk reward. We're talking about treasuries, of course, but does that logic extend to corporate debt as well? Yeah, you certainly see that in some names. Obviously, once you get to credit and other debt of that nature, you have to really think about who's the underlying business. Right? We're all pretty confident in the underlying business of the U.S. being around in 10, 20, or 30 years. But you'll see it more in credit probably in three and five years than you will super long end just because there's less debt issued on that side. But certainly those asymmetries are there. I mean, we've been long bonds for a while, which has gotten us laughed out of a lot of rooms. But <laughs> now I think folks are starting to appreciate the beauty of how that works, particularly in a static to declining rate environment. Katie and I are both excited to wake up tomorrow, turn on Bloomberg surveillance and find out what the BOJ did and what the market fallout is. I'm just going to stay awake all night. Say, I, I thought, yeah. I'm staying awake all night. I thought we were having a party. <laughs> yeah. So what do you uh, expect and how important really is it? I mean... It's very far away, and you've got to do some mental gymnastics to understand the effect of the BOJ on the U.S. Treasury market. Well, if we go back about three months, the BOJ made a statement basically that allowed the 10-year to come off of the low that it was on, right? Which is, if you look at the yield curve, there's always this divot at the 10-year, which is really this buying pressure from the BOJ. But once the BOJ took the, the stops off of the Japanese 10-year bond, the U.S. buyer was able to do the same thing. And so and they have been a large buyer of U.S. debt for a long, long time. So what they do really impacts savings here. That said, I think we've probably seen most of that impact come out of the, the equation already. All right, Alex, really enjoyed this conversation, of course, on a big week for fixed income. Our thanks to Alex Morris of FM Investments. Still ahead, we dive into one of the scariest funds in the market. That's next. This is ETFIQ on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. Time now for the ETF Brief, where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And we start with volatility between treasuries and stocks. You're looking at TLT's 10-day volatility versus SPY. What you need to know is that is the highest gap ever. So that really tells you that the bond market has been more volatile than stocks, which we already knew. But let's also talk about emerging markets. This is an interesting one. This is the fund VWO. This is Vanguard's Emerging Markets ETF. You're taking a look at short interest right now, and it is super low, 0.01%. That is the lowest going back to 2006. So short sellers thrown in the towel when it comes to emerging markets. And let's quickly talk about what we're seeing in regional banks. We're taking a look now at KRE. This was the eye of the storm in March. And as you can see, this ETF really hasn't recovered from what we saw uh, just less than a year ago, Matt. So it started to bounce a little bit in the summer. It started to give back those gains. And all told, it's a pretty scary chart. Yeah, it's definitely not... Um confidence uh, boosting. Before we go, here's a look at a, another special ETF that will spook a lot of investors. The two times long VIX futures ETF is one of the scariest funds around. It triggers a red light in the Bloomberg Intelligence traffic light system with a fitting 10 alerts for heavy leverage, daily resetting potentials, futures roll costs, and for the fund being actively managed. Better known for its ticker, U VIX, this fund is not for the faint of heart. It's intended to be a daily trading tool, even if just for a few hours for sophisticated investors who demand the risk. How? 
by doubling the returns of the long fixed futures index for a single day. This particular index offers exposure to a daily long position in the first and second month VIX futures contract. The index rolls continuously throughout each month from the first month VIX futures contract into the second month with the goal of maintaining a one month weighted maturity. Along with SVIX, these funds from volatility shares are effectively revamped versions of ETNs that were sent to the graveyard in the February 2018 Volmageddon episode and delisted after the COVID turmoil. In addition to adopting the ETF structure, the new strategies use a time-weighted average price to set closing values rather than a 4 p.m. New York time VIX settlement price. Steady volume means liquidity is not an issue. UVIX has traded around 90 million in assets and is not cheap with an expense ratio of 278 basis points. Since its revamp in March of 2022, UVIX has a scary return of about negative 95%. That dramatically trails the S&P 500 over the same time frame, but since it's meant to be a tactical product with jackpot potential, long-term performance may not matter to most investors, so use UVIX at your own peril. Our own Charlie Pellet narrating uh, that animation for us. You may recognize his voice from the Hear subway. It every day, twice a day, at least when I don't see him in the office. Uh, so it's Halloween coming up, mm -hmm. and you're a city person, so yeah. you probably won't really trick or treat. I mean, I don't. Right? Also, I don't have kids. I have a cat. Also so, that. Yeah, you, I feel like you need a smallish child in order to do that. What are you dressing up as as Halloween? I am going to be Fabio Di Gian Antonio. Okay. A okay. motorcycle racer, and I'll go around Scarsdale with my daughter Edna. She's mm -hmm. going to be Moana. Adorable. Yeah. Adorable. And we'll, well as I'm much candy a, as we can. I'm going to be a cat, uh, but I'm just going to be answering the door. But a cat. Yeah. So I, maybe I'll dress up as Uvix, if you will. But yeah, that would, that would be more. That fun. would require some exposition, a little bit of explaining, and it's an expensive product, so. I don't know if I want to yeah, do that. Yeah, but you're in the right place. If, if you're going to be in any city in the world and want people to know that you're UVIX, this is the right city. <laughs> if you can't get enough of ETFs, a reminder that you can listen to Eric Balchunas and Joel Weber on Trillions. It's their podcast that covers the industry fortnightly. That does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Matt Miller, along with Katie Greifeld. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>